Today, we're actually going to get started with some useful stuff that will help us build a real application in Vertex. We're going to talk about doing database queries. So the first thing we need to do is we need to add the Vertex module for doing JDBC. Now, in a later session, I'll tell you about the reactive data access modules, but let's keep it simple right now and we'll use the JDBC client module. This should be relatively familiar to you. JDBC, though, is inherently blocking, so this module provides an async non-blocking wrapper around JDBC capabilities. Uh, we already have the Postgres JDBC driver, so we don't need another database driver. And what we're going to do inside of database vertical is create a SQL client. We'll just call it client. And we're going to add a composed method here to configure that client. This configure SQL client. And we implement that method as a future of type void configure SQL client and it takes a void unused parameter. We say SQL client, uh, actually the client equals JDBC client create shared. Now why are we doing create shared? Create shared means that if we deploy this vertical multiple times at a later date, let's say we create this as a worker vertical that can have multiple instances running in parallel. Create shared means that Vertex will coordinate a shared JDBC connection pool across all those workers, which is what we want. Uh, we're going to need the configuration and the configuration is going to be in our config object under the key DB. How do I know that? Because we're about to add it. If you recall, we set up our configuration to pull by default from this config.json, but we can override it from the command line. We can override it from uh, the file system. So inside of this DB key, we will put URL. We're going to put our username. We're going to put our password. And for convenience sake, we're also going to put our admin user, although we probably wouldn't ever want to put this in production. Uh, I'm only doing it here for convenience sake. All right, these two, these last two parameters are really not part of configuring the JDBC client. They're purely being used, uh, which I'll show you in a few minutes for the database migrations. So when I say here that we grab the config, if you recall from main vertical, when we deploy all of our verticals, we're setting it from our loaded config and then we're just grabbing the db key subtree there and then all we have to do is return promise succeeded promise of client as a future I was wrong. We just need to return a succeeded promise of type void. Because we're storing this in the SQL client. <clears throat> so that's done. The next convenience method, method that we need is a way to get a database connection. 
So actually, no, take that back. We don't need that. That's actually really easy. What we really need is a way to run a query that we can easily pass in the query itself, the parameters, and return it as a future. So we're going to say future of type result set, and we'll call this query with parameters. And it's going to take a SQL connection. It's going to take a query and it's going to take a JSON array containing our parameters. And what this is going to do is allow us to run a query asynchronously. So we're going to return future result set future and we're going to do con dot query with params query params and the result handler is our promise there's that two more convenience method methods future JSON object map to first result. This is where we only want to get the first result. Uh, maybe it's the only result. And it's going to take a result set. And we're going to return Actually, we're going to say if rs dot get num rows is greater than or equal to one, because if there are no rows, that's an error. We're going to say return promise succeeded promise rs dot get rows get the first one as a future. So get rows returns a list of JSON objects. We're going to grab the first one, wrap it in this future, and return it. If there are no rows, we want to return an error. So we're going to say promise.failed promise. And in this case, we're going to say no results. And return that as a future. What is going wrong here? Uh, method promises. No, the arguments. Oh, sorry. Failed. There we go. So that's our next convenience method. The final convenience method is going to be future of type JSON array map to JSON array, which accepts a result set. And this is going to be as simple as saying return promise succeeded promise rs.get. Oh, actually, got ahead of myself and need to say new JSON array. rs.get rows and return it as a future. There's that. That's all of our convenience methods. So we've got a way to configure our SQL client. We've got a way to query with parameters. We can map to a single result as a JSON object. We can get all of our results as a JSON array.
Next thing we need to do is we're going to be working with raw SQL. So I'm going to define some queries as static values. What I'll probably do is I will uh, fast forward through some of this. You can always look at the code later because this is all repetitive and sort of dull, but I'm going to create all the queries we need. All right, now that we've created all these queries, let's create the methods that will use them. All right, so we've implemented all of our methods now, and you'll notice there's a lot of repetition among these. Uh, we could probably refactor this, and I probably will at a later date refactor this to take all of the common bits out of each of these methods and put them in separate helper methods as well. Let's talk through some of the specifics of what I've done here. So we've got our configure SQL client and you'll notice that each of these methods takes a message object. This is because these requests for these database interactions are going to come through over the event bus as messages. So we'll actually need to wire in the event bus, which means we need to have another future of type void uh, configure event bus consumers and it's also going to take an unused void parameter and we'll say vertex dot event bus consumer and we need addresses let's talk a little bit about event bus addresses they are arbitrary strings as long as they're unique it doesn't matter what they are as long as they're an arbitrary string what I sometimes like to do is to create public static final string uh, list all to do's address equals and then I like to somehow uniquely identify the application and then the operation So I would use this as my event bus address and attach a handler and that handler is going to be list all to do's. And once we're done configuring all of those, we're going to say return promise void succeeded promise future. All right, there's that done. We put this into our sequential composition. 
this configure event bus consumers. Now, anywhere else inside of our application can send event bus messages to these endpoints and expect to get their results back. Next time around, I'll to tell you how we can wire this into our web application. But I do want to make sure that I tell you, yes, this is a little ugly. Yes, this is not as nice and pretty as you might expect from other frameworks. Don't sweat it too much. We're going to show you how this can be made much nicer, much easier to interact with as we progress. But you got to start with the simple stuff before you can move on to the complex. Thanks again and talk to you soon.